Living the Faith podcast, brought to you by Restoring the Faith Media, restoringthefaith.com. Welcome back to another episode of Living the Faith. This is Ben, Joe, and Mike, and we're here to talk to you today about confession. All right, so you ever had one of those confessional horror stories? And we've all heard them, right? And this isn't going to be oh boy, this isn't going to be the horror story where you know you had something really embarrassing that you wanted to confess, or the line was super long and mass was about to start, and you weren't sure if you were going to make it through before mass, and then you, you know, all those things. All right, you ever been in front of a priest and you confessed a sin that you know for sure is a sin, and the priest looks back at you and he says, "Hey, you know." That's not even a sin, Mike, what you're saying right now. Um, So there's really no reason for you to be sitting here. And the priest actually withholds absolution. I mean, at that point, like, what do you do? Oh, my gosh. So first of all, before we go ahead and answer that question, probably should break down what confession really is. So first of all, of course, it's one of the seven sacraments of the Catholic Church. It's a very important sacrament. It is the sacrament by which we confess our sins before God and God forgives us through a priest. This is, as all the other sacraments were, instituted by Christ. Right. I mean, we all know this as Catholics. Our Lord specifically looks to the apostles. He says, look, whatever you bound on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. That is the scripture. We all know that. Um, This power to forgive sins was given to Peter. It was given to all the apostles. I was trying to find a quote. So there's the other quote, which is actually a better quote, where it says, go and show yourself to the priest after he cures the lepers of their sins. And so this is a great setup on the part of Christ for us to fully understand the nature of confession, because not only is he God, Christ is then, after having cured these people, uh, are setting them forth you know, to confess themselves to the priest. And then, of course, we're looking at the quote, uh, Matthew 16, 19, and I will give to thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind upon earth, it shall be bound also in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose upon earth, it shall be loosed also in heaven. So obviously clear, biblical words of Christ, you know, the foundation and creation of the sacrament of confession. So It's obviously, it's evolved over time, but the church has definitively spoken in terms of what uh, confession looks like. What are the necessary com- components for a valid confession? I mean, and... That is both in relation to the to the penitent and to the confessor. So the penitent has to, you know, basically have, have true contrition, um, actual contrition for his or her sins, um, a firm purpose of amendment, and make the confession, and then perform the penance given to him or her by the priest. Yeah. So just a clarification on that. Of course, the th- it, it's a total of three things that are valid for. Uh, confession, right? First of all, remember, if you do not do one of these things, you didn't have a valid confession. You leave the confessional without doing one of these things, you did not have a valid confession. If it was an accident, then you you still didn't have a confession. You should go back and say, I accidentally forgot to do this or whatnot, but it certainly did not happen. If you did it intentionally, it would be sacrilegious and you would have to go and confess all those sins again and also confess on top of that a sacrilege. So again, three things. First of all, the Catholic must examine his conscience honestly and thoroughly and not withholding confession of any mortal sins. You have got to confess all of your mortal sins. This is the only exception, right? If you forget honestly a mortal sin, uh, honestly, um, then you can go back in a following confession and confess that mortal sin. Secondly, uh, the confessor the person going to confession must actually be truly contrite and repentant. You must be truly sorry for your sins. Not, eh, I'm just repeating my sins because this is what I do in the confessional. I have to actually be sorry for that. And the third point that a lot of people forget, and you'll see this, of course, on tons and tons in Hollywood, right? Because they, everybody just thinks, ah, yeah, we just say we're sorry. And then we go, we're like the The mafia, right? We just go and say, I killed 10 people this week, and then I go kill another 10 people the next week, right? It doesn't work like that. You have got to actually have a firm purpose of amendment. You have got to have a plan. You've got to honestly intend that I am not going to commit at least that mortal sin ever again. 
Yeah, like let's say, um, you know, in modern America where we really don't have a proper understanding of the courtship process, you've got a young man and woman who are cohabitating and you might go in and you can, can you might confess and you might even have real contrition about uh, sins of the flesh that you may have committed in that particular environment. But if you go into the confessional and you confess that sin and you still plan to go home that night and you're still cohabitating with that person, then you're still placing yourself in that particular situation. You have not made a firm purpose of amendment. You haven't said to yourself, I'm going to change my life radically and remove my soul from the possibility of further committing that grave sin. And the priest would have an obligation in that situation too to, to question you in the confessional and, and ask you if you are in fact cohabitating. And if the answer is yes, then he doesn't have the authority or the ability to forgive your sin at that point. He cannot confer absolution onto your soul until you demonstrate a firm purpose of amendment, right? Um, until you come to him and say, hey, I've moved out. Uh, I'm, I've, I'm in my own place. We're respecting each other as human persons, and we're not going to place ourselves in that particular situation. We're going to have chaperones. Maybe we're moving up our marriage day, whatever it is, but you have you have taken steps to amend your life. It's not just, hey, I'm going to try harder next time. So yeah, that's those 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 three points are very very important, right? And it's it's easy to lose sight of them. Many of you may not have ever been informed that those were the case, and if you have been informed, it was at a young age. It's always good to make sure that you remember that those are the three things. Didn't have a confession. Didn't happen if those three things aren't present. Secondly, every um, sacrament has a matter and form. So like the Blessed Sacrament, for example, the matter of that is the bread and the wine, and the form are the words that the priest says, right? In terms of the matter of confession are your sins. This is what is being treated. And the form is the words of the absolution. Correct. Yeah, so it's not a validly conferred sacrament then if the priest doesn't conform his language to the words of absolution. If he just says, okay, exactly. go in peace, yeah. my son, I forgive you, or God forgives you, then that's not, it didn't, didn't happen. happen. Yep. <laughs> yep, didn't happen, not a confession, not an absolution. You still need to go to somebody yep. else. All right, and so, so you got to go again. You got to go find another priest. Yeah, absolutely. And unfortunately, that priest puts you in the situation where you are, it's now incumbent upon you. He doesn't have to do anything. Uh, you have to go find somebody else, right? And I, I think, without exception, all three of us have experienced this at least one time. Okay, so if that happens to me, I, I do my utmost not to leave. I, I keep begging for him to use the actual words of absolution so that I don't have to go and confess these sins to somebody else. And, and those words that we're looking for, right, are specifically, I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So, Joe, you made reference to a thorough examination of conscience, which this is something that we should be doing in our nightly prayers as well within our, our litany. We should review our actions of the day, and we should review all of our shortcomings as part of our routine when you examine your conscience, what are the what what are the tools that you're looking for? How's that done? So yeah, with regards to an examination of conscience, there are some great tools out there. Uh, you can find them online. You can also find them in uh, some very good missiles. Uh, they're fantastic examinations of conscience that will literally go one through ten through each of the ten commandments and um, ask you a bunch of general questions uh, about your sins that you committed since the last time you were uh, went to confession so I've that you can actually ask you these. <laughs> Sorry, I keep interrupting you. I've seen some of these examination of consciences that are not organized in that fashion, not organized by the Ten Commandments, and they just seem to be so random and they're hard to follow, and it's so much easier to, in your mind to organize your uh, your confession and examine your conscience in light For of sure. the Ten Commandments. There, yep. there, there are uh, examinations of conscience which 
not only uh, ask you a bunch of questions organized by the each commandment, but then there's like this miscellaneous section at the end where it doesn't may, maybe doesn't fit into specifically into the Ten Commandments, and th- those are always like the juicier sins that you're not even really thinking about, and and mm-hmm. then when you read them, you're like, oh man, I th- <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty like sure the precepts I did of that. the church, right? Exactly. Of course, the precepts of the church do still fall under the Ten Commandments, just not. Uh, clearly, right? It it requires more uh, theological understanding about where those necessarily well, fall under. To that point, that's why the daily examination is so important because you are constantly training your mind to recognize where the vices are in your life, and then you know the opposite of that is working towards the virtue that is opposite of that vice, and then doing so on a, on a daily basis. And if you're not even aware of what some of those vices that you're falling into, then you can never confess it. If you can't confess it, then you can't correct it. So yeah, the daily examination is, is yeah, it's absolutely essential. Can't get out of it. So of course, we did also talk with regards to mortal sins, right? And this is very important to understand this concept as well, because if you don't understand that they're uh, mortal, et cetera, you're going to run into problems in your confessions, right? So you have to got to understand what a mortal sin is. Mortal sin is composed of three parts. Grievous matter, sufficient reflection, and full consent of the will. So obviously it has to be something of a grievous nature. Um, You have to know that the thing that you're doing is of a grievous nature, and you have to choose that grievous thing, that grievous action, and you must do it with full consent of the will. So you cannot not be partially aware of what you're doing. You have to be fully aware, and the will has to be fully engaged. And of course, if you go to conf- if you go to mass, and you uh, you have the stain of mortal sin on your soul which the effect of mortal sin is to kill any grace in your soul. Your soul is effectively dead. And if you go to Mass and you receive communion in a state of mortal sin, you are in fact uh, committing another sin. You are uh, committing a sacrilege. So it's pretty important that you go to confession before you receive the Holy Eucharist. That doesn't mean you can't go to Mass, you just don't receive if you're in a state of mortal sin and you're uh, hopefully trying to get to confession uh, at your first possible opportunity. Don't ever wait. Go now. Uh, there's never a good time to have a mortal sin on your soul. There are many actual stories that can speak to this. There was a, a time where this uh, boy, uh, we all, I think many of us have heard of St. John Bosco. He was a, an Italian saint, um, a priest. He was the original Father Flanagan, right? <laughs> Before Father Flanagan, Boys Town, that sort of thing. This was St. John Bosco. And St. John Bosco had a school for boys in Italy. And so he um, took care of these boys off the street and even from other people's homes, whatnot. But he had a school for them. And uh, there's a fantastic stories that you should look up online about the dreams of St. John Bosco. Uh, a lot of the stories of the things that uh, St. John Bosco would see in his dreams about the souls of his boys, uh, parishioners, etc., and so on and so forth. So a tremendous, tremendous saint. But there are also several confessional miracles that uh, were a result. And I don't know, in this case, this is maybe not so much a miracle as it is um, a manifestation. There was a a uh, boy of 12 years old uh, going into the confessional of St. John Bosco, and St. John Bosco could read souls. And this boy told his sins to John Bosco, and John Bosco read his soul and said, My son, have you finished telling me your sins? And the boy said, Yes, Father, I'm, I'm done. And he repeated to him again, he said, are you absolutely sure that you have finished confessing your sins? There was some silence, and the boy muttered, yes, Father. And he said, look over your shoulder. And the boy turned his head inside the confessional box, and standing inches away from his face was Satan himself staring him down trying to tempt him to withhold his sins from the priest. Look, th- th- this, is, this is something that I'm sure that people have dealt with in the confessional. Uh, many, many, many people. This is not an unusual thing. You're not special if you're afraid or embarrassed to tell your sins to the priest. The point is, is uh, often I even um, told my aunt one time, she 
said this to me in some conversation that she just would got would get very self conscious and whatnot. And obviously, one does. You're confessing your sins and laying them in front of a human being who is representing Christ, but you are confessing to Christ, and it's really important to remember that. Oftentimes, in many confessionals, you'll see, you'll have a crucifix. If your confessional at your parish doesn't have one, it's probably useful to pull out your rosary and look at the crucifix on your rosary or whatnot. But when you are confessing, pro tip, looking at the crucifix helps remind you of why you're doing this and what Christ did for you, and that you have committed this sin against Christ. You haven't committed a sin against this priest. You've committed a sin against Christ. That's who you're confessing to in as as the priest uh, representing Christ and as a reminder to look at the crucifix and make sure to always say your mortal sins. It is not worth, like you were saying earlier before, Mike, it's not worth not confessing all of your mortal sins because you just end up with the same ones plus a sacrilege, which is another mortal sin. Okay, so uh, another um, another confessional miracle, this time with less uh, ominous <laughs> tones. And, and um, no, that was good. I don't know how to follow that. But everybody knows St. Padre Pio. He had a, a zeal for souls, and he would spend 16 hours a day in the confessional. I mean, it was one of the hallmarks of, of who he was. Well, there was a pretty interesting story I came across of a Canadian woman who had flown all the way from Vancouver, right? Vancouver is on the western side of Canada. So she crossed the North American continent, Atlantic Ocean, goes all the way to Italy to meet the famed Padre Pio and, of course, offer him her confession. And so she gets into the confessional and he says, my daughter, I'm sorry, you, you have to leave. She's like, what? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I can't hear your confession until you go back to your store. She was a she was a owner of a clothing store and she was selling pants to women. And he said, until you go and rid your inventory and don't don't give it away so that it will be worn, burn it. Burn your inventory and then come back to me and offer your confession. <laughs> and just so you're not thinking that Padre Pio was like this misogynist or sexist, he would do the same thing for men who were wearing shorts or who otherwise were immodestly dressed. And in fact, he was quoted as saying, what pain it costs me to shut the door on someone. The Lord has forced me to do so. I am just his useless tool. I mean, this is a guy who would spend 16 hours a day in the confessional and he, he, he loved souls so much and and wanted to be like the sewer just washing the filth of sin away from his his flock from his people and really from an international audience who would come to see him so i really do believe that it did pain him to send anybody away this is not one of those confessional horror stories where the priest sends you away telling you that you didn't sin in fact this is the story where the priest is sending you away saying look you haven't made a firm purpose of amendment Maybe this woman wasn't even aware of what she was doing. We don't really know, but um, I thought that was a pretty interesting and miraculous story of of uh, soul soul reading by a very famous priest. As you say, you know that must have been absolutely hor- horrible for him. But he wasn't going to participate in making their soul dirtier than it was before it left him. Right? It was going out at least the same as it uh, at the same as it went in or clean. Right. Yeah, I mean, I'm he, not he watching used this. To, he used to inspect the the confessional lines, you know, as he's as he's. There's already a line formed before he even gets into the confessional, right? I mean, can you imagine that? Like, like you've got you've got your. You got your like Black Friday crowds who are camped out and waiting for the doors to open. I mean, imagine you've got a crowd of people waiting for your confessional doors to open. What an amazing sight that would be! But he would actually like walk the line. And anybody who was presenting themselves in a church of God who was not adhering to the minimum standards of modesty, he used to post a sign that said, women, your skirts will be at least eight inches below your knees. And no, don't borrow someone else's dresses just to come to confessional because I'll know no, better. That's great. Um, one of my uh, favorite stories as to the power of confession was actually in relation to extreme unction. And there was a priest uh, that I knew. Uh, he's now dead. God rest his soul. Um, but in the late 90s, uh, he was called to the uh, sickbed of someone in hospital. And uh, by the time he arrived, the person was already dead. And he was so many hours late 
uh, to the deathbed. He had traveled quite a distance that they had already taken the body to the morgue. And the priest uh, obviously felt very bad, and he still wanted to make sure that he had done all that he could. So he went to the morgue and uh, performed extreme unction, which typically you're not allowed to do. The body has to at least be warm. And he never told me whether or not the body was warm, but he said he was performing the rite of extreme unction on the body, the anointing of the body. And then when it came time for the confession of the sins and absolution, he addressed the body directly and said, are you sorry for your sins and do you seek um, absolution for them? And the body literally groaned, yes, on the slab at the morgue. And the priest finished the... Uh, he gave absolution, finished extreme unction, and he said it was like air being slowly out, let out of a paper bag. The chest just slowly collapsed on the body. And uh, yeah, um, certainly one of the most amazing stories I've heard. But once again, just illustrating the importance of making a good confession, staying in a state of grace. Um, you know, we've all been given the advice, make every confession that you have the, as good as the last one needs to be. Uh, so always live as though this confession might be the last one that you ever make and make it as best as you possibly can because uh, it matters. <laughs> it matters. Absolutely. And if you're if you're behind at all on, you know, confessions, it's been a long time since you've been to confession. First of all, you got to get back to confession. Um, second of all, that's probably going to take a while. It should take a while if it's been a while since your last confession. Remember, we do also have an obligation as Catholics to receive Holy Communion once a year. Um, that is a precept of the church. That is a sin if you do not receive our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament at least once a year. And if it's been once a year in this day and age, more than likely um, you have some sins that you need to account for. Um, so take note of that. Remember, that means that you're going to have to go to confession at least once a year before you receive Christ in the blessed sacrament and, uh, probably should make it a general confession, general confession. Um, that is something that your priest can take care of. Uh, that's something that you make an appointment with. Um, if it's too scary for you to actually have the priest know who you are, you can always call the priest anonymously and ask him to, uh, meet you in the confessional at a time that he should pick, um, and make a general confession, which requires, of course, a very general examination of conscience. Um, general examination of consciences, uh, range for, um, can range for your entire life, right? Um, you can also do them for a period of however many years, but you would tell the priest in the confessional, um, you know, the, the range that you're referring to, and then uh, c make sure that you can call out as many mortal sins as possible. Make sure that you just get every single one, naming at least a number how many you can uh, remember. Um, you write it down if you have to, Give that general confession, get back on track. It's advisable not to go even over a month without going to confession. Uh, frequent confessions right. are a tremendous and, grace. And a note on the general confession point. So we, I don't think we've really talked about why anyone would do a general confession. So the whole point is to call to mind to yourself and then also acknowledge that to a priest, uh, the, the habit of your life. So when you do a general confession and you are giving the summation of, let's say, the, the last five years or the last six years since your last general confession, you're literally telling the priest, listen, this is how I lived my life. These are these are the major sins that I've committed. And the priest can can really diagnose the disposition of your life at that point. So this isn't, you know, there hasn't been two weeks, it has been one week, it has been a month. This has been a number of years. Your these are your predominant faults, the things that come up, and you can then focus on correcting those predominant faults. And that's why they're so important, because obviously your predominant faults are the things that are holding you back from achieving virtue. So the general confession is not just for lap, lapsed Catholics. It's not just for someone who hasn't been to confession in a long time. In fact, in a general confession, you have the opportunity to truly say that you are sorry for sins that maybe you've already confessed. It's, it's sort of like, Joe, like if I, if I run over your dog and I'm immediately sorry, I'm like, hey, I'm sorry about that. But then upon further reflection, I really come to a deeper understanding and a real sorrow for what I did. Um, when I first did it, I ran to confession. I came to you and I said, I'm really sorry. I ran over your dog and I wanted to get it cleared up. But later on, I come to you and I say, hey, Joe, 
I just want you to know, I really am sorry. I was, I was reckless. I was careless. It shouldn't have happened. I know how much you love that dog. And now you can never get it back. And it's because of me. And I'm really sorry. That's what a general confession is. It's, it's, it's a wrap up of, it's of a longer period of time. It can mm-hmm. cover sins that you've already confessed uh, in, a, in a weekly or, or monthly confession. And it is a way, it is a tool for you. As, as Ben said, not only is it a tool for the priest to better understand you and counsel your soul, but it's also a tool for you to, to give your true sorrow and contrition to our Lord and to better understand your own predominant flaws. Absolutely. Pro tip, uh, you can also pray for help in preparing for confession. Several saints have made reference to praying to Our Lady. I I try to make a habit of praying three Hail Marys before every confession, asking Our Lady that I tell all of my sins to the priest, that I am truly sorry for my sins, and that I have a firm purpose of amendment. And you need grace to do these things, right? This, This is not on your own, by yourself, you, God gives you the grace, uh, but asking Our Lady to dispense those graces to you uh, is very important, as well as you could pray to St. Gerard Magella, who is not only the patron saint of birth, uh, giving birth, but as well as the patron saint of good confessions. Okay, so just a note on practical stuff, and we're only saying this because we really want to have a bunch of priests be very, very pleased with this show, and they're going to be happy that we're telling you this, <laughs> but confession is not counseling session, okay? It's not a time to have a right. long conversation yeah. or to justify yourself. It's, I did this many sins, I did it this many times, and I'm sorry, period, end of story. Please, 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 when you go into confession, have a plan, all right? And if you <laughs> if you do the examination of conscience and if you give your confession in the order of the Ten Commandments, or at least in the groupings, like six and nine tend to go together or whatever, um, that's great. But the confessional line should be a line, it's, it shouldn't be the DMV line, okay? It should move along, and <laughs> it shouldn't take 30 minutes per confessional. So if Mrs. McGilligutty is in front of you and unfortunately she's not ready and she wants to tell the priest how bad her husband was and how he made her sin because of all these things, please don't be that person. St. Gerard Magella. Pray for us. Pray for us. <laughs>